Hello and welcome to the Just For Gamers video game podcast. Episode 177, Dave Gowdy. In this episode, Ash tags in Alex so he can go on and move house. Alex has been to Barcelona. Alex has come back from Barcelona. And finally, Alex is talking about himself in third person. Hello and welcome to the JFG Podcast. This is episode 177. My name is Alex, and I'm not joined by my good friend Ash Buddies because he is currently moving house, so can't make it onto the show this week, Uh, which brings us to a second solo effort from the JFG boys in a row, buddies. Ash has tagged me in, so to speak, Um, and here I am. Not sure when Ash is going to be back up and running. I'm pretty sure he was bang on it for the uh, internet side of things with his new place as you would as you do as you would so hopefully he'll be back next week but either way i will continue to fly the flag as i have just come back from my holiday buddies uh that's right buenos dias or buenos noches uh, one of them it really does depend when you're listening i've been to barcelona uh which is technically in spain though they're not super keen on that um this is due to the fact that they were they want independence from Spain, uh, becoming their own thing, uh, like David S. Pumpkins, buddies. Um, obviously, I'm not absolutely the right person to break down their recent uh, alleged illegal referendum, denial of independence and subsequent convictions of various heads of state, followed by the Yellow Ribbon campaign showing solidarity to those incarcerated, uh, considered illegal by many of the inhabitants of the region. Uh, probably not my sort of ne- not not really for me don't think so that was decent though fair play you've learned something there perhaps um instead i'm going to talk about things what i have done which seems far more at the speed of this particular fucking show buddies so here we are um things what i have done obviously most of them barcelona based i went up a big mountain uh in a cable car uh, and at the top i found a bar that sold uh two pint beers so a large beer it was two pints now this sounds tremendous to me, and you, you'll know uh, from listening to the show, if you have done before, buddies, that uh, we're quite big drinkers, and we like talking about some booze, and the idea of double the booze that you would get in a in a pub over here sounds good on paper, except it's 35 degrees, you're probably drinking it outside, uh, and you therefore have to drink it very quickly, otherwise it both goes flat and warm, and these are two things that don't agree with beer whatsoever. So uh, I vote against this two-pint system, although it was indeed slightly cheaper than buying two separate pints. I think probably just spend the extra uh, euro cents and uh, and buy two pints in a row. So that was good. That was fine. I did that. Uh, I also visited uh, a park and a selection of buildings designed by a guy named Gaudi, uh, this joker man. He's a he's a fucking trickster, uh, yeah. So Park Guell, uh, which is some sort of famous park up on the hillside overlooking the city. Then you've got all these buildings designed by Gaudi. I don't remember his first name. It's probably Dave. I think it's probably Dave Gaudi. Um, the buildings are all kind of organic and weird looking. Uh, if you know anything about Barcelona, then you'll you'll know what I'm talking about here. But yeah, like like someone took a normal building. Uh, and then baked a selection of weird fa- like facades in a clay oven and stuck them on the front. It's, it's quite cool. Uh, it looks pretty weird. They're just dotted about the city in between uh, what I would describe as normal buildings. So that's fine. Um, and he also designed this cathedral uh, called La Sagrada Familia. Uh, that's solid, solid effort there. Uh, which is still being built. As in there's cranes and they're still building it. Um, and that suggests to me that as well as being a master architect, he was a uh, good fucking talker, buddies. He somehow managed to convince a city to build a cathedral for over a hundred years. 
and that's more impressive than the architecture if you ask me um so yeah it's it's weird you go inside it's like a super old cathedral like you'd expect but then there's like a, a fucking metal spiral staircases like around the edge some maybe some glass lifts um elevators up to the top uh pretty weird just fucking massive and opulent and strange um so yeah if you ever go to barcelona take that in definitely uh and the buildings as well because they're pretty cool uh what else went to the beach uh, there were lots of old women with their baps out uh the sort of image that is burnt onto your retina uh, until the day that you die which is unfortunate um I noticed a bit of a trend here. The sort of bigger, older, and more haggard the woman, the less they gave a fuck about whether they were uh, nude. Um, And that was unfortunate for everybody else. So probably the less said about that, the better. Um, Probably one of the big highlights went to uh, the Camp New, Camp Now, the new camp, um, to see Barcelona take on Boca Juniors, which is fucking weird. Like, I never thought I'd get to see the champions of Argentina play football, um, let alone in Barcelona, in the new Camp. Uh, This stadium is probably the real cathedral of the town. Stupidly big, holds like 99,500 people. Um, Lots of dickheads in there. Everyone seemed to be flossing, doing various uh, dances. They have one of these roaming cameras uh, with emojis on a screen and if it landed on that person they were supposed to do the emoji I mean the, this is the sort of thing that makes you want to just die really like maybe swan dive off of a balcony but more importantly the football was fantastic and the experience was fantastic it's just so big it's so stupidly big um, and really steep so even though I was really far back because you know cheap cunts um really good view still which was kind of odd uh and it's quite cool to visit the stadium that kind of opens uh pro evolution soccer we buy it every year it does the stupid barcelona song and shows you the stadium and and everything um and it was pretty cool to actually see that for real the song's still terrible um and they sang it maybe five times so they clearly aren't aware of how awful it is but it just sounds like a midi production uh to to me um so yeah, that was cool. Good football. Messi scored. You know Messi. He's the one who's basically Jesus. So that was cool that he scored. And I get to say that he did that. And I was there. So that's pretty special. Um, that's basically it. Stupid amounts of great food. Obviously, we were in Spain or uh, Catalonia. Whatever you want to call it. Um, went to a place, uh, a tapas bar called Bodega Beeritz. And... I have to say, like, I'm, I'll now I'll now provide you with a selection of points, uh, uh, topics, tasks, um, facts about Bodega Beeritz. And after I've provided you with these facts, then you'll think to yourself, no fucker would ever go to that restaurant. That's really dumb. Well, I have to say, the food certainly has to be excellent after this selection of things. So firstly, uh, they only take cash even though they're like a normal restaurant in a a bustling part of town and every other place in the fucking town takes cards. Uh, You cannot book a table under any circumstances, even though it's incredibly popular, like really high up on TripAdvisor, always busy. So you, you literally have to queue in the road and obviously everyone's queuing in the road. So we waited half an hour for a table, just standing there like dickheads. Um, they will only accept parties of two or four. So if there's one of you, no chance unless you make a friend. Uh, if there is an, uh, three or more than four of you, then you're fucked. Uh, separate up, split into twos or fours. You get the picture. Um, and this is because the place is so tiny and so popular that they've got configurations inside of you either sit at the bar as a two or as a four at a table and... They're not going to waste. They're not going to have any empty seats in there because there's people waiting, fucker. So there you go. Um, and then you can't. You also can't pick your food. There's only two options on the menu. They are uh, a selection of eight tapas or um, a starting platter and a selection of eight tapas. So you can't choose your food. You can't book it. It's cash only. You have to queue for it, um, and you can only go in if you're at even numbers. But it was absolutely amazing. I'd still recommend it to anyone. It was worth the wait. 
Um, you just sort of sit at the counter and the chef's like, what do you like? Do you like meaty stuff? Do you like veggie stuff? How spicy do you like shit? And you just say those things and then they just provide you with some food for a flat fee. Um, and it was comfortably the best um, tapas I've ever had in my life. As as someone who's like a mega fan uh, of tapas, it was some sort of fucking nirvana of tapas, I would say. So yeah, highly recommend that. That's near La Rambla. I'm kind of, you know, obviously this is a gaming podcast podcast. I'm kind of burning through this very quickly. Hopefully this will be useful to anyone who's listening who does visit Barcelona um, because it's kind of no nonsense uh, in the way that I'm thinking about it. But yeah, so that was great. Uh, Great restaurants, great place. Uh, It wasn't my idea to go there. We kind of take it in turns, myself and the missus. This was her vote this time around. Uh, We came away with me kind of feeling like it was one of the best places I've ever been, probably in my sort of top five cities I've ever been to in my life. And I didn't expect that. So yeah. So there you go, buddies. That's Barcelona with a little bow on top. Um, Other than that, uh, I went out drinking with friend of the podcast, Paul. But that's every week, so that's probably not worth talking about. Um, Off to a barbecue with friend of the podcast, Mark, at the weekend. That's kind of exciting. Going to play a bit of Wheel Town uh, with his boy, I think. Um, But other than that, I think we should probably move on. So uh, let's go and talk about what I've been playing. So as I tuck into my gin and 7-up free buddies, uh, I've got a a decent little list, considering I've been away for sort of five of the um, days since I last was on the show. Um, And we'll get the ball rolling with the weird pick of the last time we were talking about what I've been playing, and that was Life is Strange. Um, This is a game that we've had for ages. Uh, That first episode was free on PS Plus. And then we, for some reason, picked up the whole thing. I think it was it was like six quid or something for the other four episodes, and we thought, fuck it, um, it seems sort of promising, and then we never got into it. Um, I have burnt through that game relatively quickly. Not It's not especially long, you know, maybe a couple of hours each episode. Um, but I have finished it now. I completed it, and I really enjoyed it, even though, it, as I said last time round, uh, this game is not for me. Uh, it's... Uh, well, I think that the the studio think it's for teenagers. I think a lot of teenagers would probably roll their eyes at it because the script is very sort of uh, middle-aged people in a boardroom going, what do kids say? What the fuck do they talk like? Oh, yeah, there you go. Rad amazeballs. Chuck it in. Um, so, yeah, it's a bit cringy in places. Um, and the obviously this lives and dies by its story and its uh, voice acting is therefore completely integral um, and for the most part, that's very good. But towards the end of the game, the, the sort of main character sort of... I don't know, she kind of... Everything was so sort of somber and, and miserable and bad things were happening and it seemed like she didn't really know how to play that. Maybe she didn't quite have the depth um, to her performance. So everything kind of just came out a little bit sort of hushed and whispered, like a sort of... Oh my God, I can't believe this. Like all the time sort of under her breath kind of thing. That was a little bit off-putting. But for the most part, I mean, there's no way I would have played this thing to the end if I didn't give a shit about any of the characters. So they obviously were doing something right, even if they were a little bit larger than life, a little bit fucking Fortnite generation. Um, So yeah, I I really enjoyed it. Uh, The ending was very cool. Um, I kind of got the impression that there were really just... There's just these two endings that you can get, and the decisions that you make... Uh, elsewhere, of which there are many, um, they affect how the characters talk to you during the game, but that doesn't really change the way things pan out right at the death. You've got two options, uh, sort of life and death choice. Um, a couple of weird dream sequences that I've never been a fan of in any game, like uh, Max Payne springs to mind with its running along the blood tra- trail thing. Um, this wasn't as annoying as that, but it was this sort of weird... Um, floating landscape in in the middle of a dream sequence where you're kind of avoiding people for basically no reason, and if they see you, then it, it like you fail and have to start again, and that wasn't fun uh, to be honest, and kind of pointless. It just felt a bit a bit sort of like padding to me. They were obviously trying to make it so that the character was sort of lost in her own mind. Um, I just don't think that ever really works very well. These dream sequences, but hey. Um, 
all in all, uh, I'd highly recommend this. The trailer for the second one uh, was finally uh, revealed this week. Uh, obviously, we're in the midst of Gamescom at the moment. And uh, nothing to do with the first game at all. Uh, completely new characters, set in the same universe, allegedly, but uh, completely new characters. Um, um, a couple of brothers, like a sort of 16-year-old and a 9-year-old, uh, who are sort of running from the law. So it looks like it's going to be a bit of a road trip movie kind of game, rather than being in this specific place. This one was set in a little town called Arcadia. Uh, but yeah, it's done. It's certainly done enough, and that with Captain Spirit as well, which I, I quite liked, even though it was sort of, there wasn't much there. Um, it's made me very interested for Life is Strange too. So um, yeah, not too long to wait for that, and um, may well jump in on that first one. They, they usually do uh, it pretty cheap for that first episode to try and get you sort of suckered in and uh, on on the season pass train. So uh, we may well do that. But yeah, uh, I, I really recommend it. It's, it's good fun. Life is strange, and uh, some good puzzles in there as well that really kind of make you think. Where you've got to sort of retrieve items by uh, keep rewinding time to get to the stage where you can get them, um, even though the repercussions of that are harsh and drastic. And then you can rewind all the way back, keeping the item you've got in your pocket uh, as if none of it ever happened, and you've just pilfered them somehow. So yeah, that was cool. Uh, elsewhere this week, God of War. Uh, this is probably the last time I'll be talking about God of War, although um, there has been the announcement now that there's going to be a new game plus on God of War. I just, I've never done new game plus on any game, so it seems unlikely that I'll play through that. I, I might start it, um, but I don't know. It always seems a bit pointless to me. Essentially, you know, you've got a load of new gear or whatever, but all the enemies are harder as well. So it just sort of. You know, it levels it levels up accordingly, making it kind of pointless to me, um, especially in a game like this where uh, it wasn't the be all and end all. Uh, your loadout was important when it came to uh, the style of fighting that you wanted, but it, it didn't. It, you weren't actually ranking up your character. It was only the the gear that you had gave you your level. So um, that was kind of different. Um, but yeah, platinum to the game. Uh, a couple of really tricky bits at the end, but for the most part, it wasn't much of a ball ache. There's uh, a few collectibles that you need to get, but it's it, the game's. N it's not one of these games where uh, you can't work out where the fuck you've got to go to get the last few bits. Each region of the map is separated up into sort of entry points, and that's kind of known as those zones. And on the main sort of um, overworld map, you can look at each zone, and it'll tell you you're missing one of these things or two of these things or whatever. So. Um, it really didn't take very long from the bit where we completed the game completely to um, actually platinum it, you know, ticking every box or so on. Um, the only really difficult thing was the very final battle. Uh, I don't want to spoil anything here, um, but there is a, a sort of a selection of bosses that you can fight once you complete the game. Um, and when you fight all of them and win, then you can fight a sort of mega boss. Uh, and it took me a hell of a lot of goes uh, to, to finish that off. Um, so yeah, um, obviously platinum in games is you either do or you don't. Uh, I've been off work for some time and that's why I've been able to do that. But it's probably not worth actually your, your time doing it. Um, but yeah, that's God of War. And um, Mafia 3 is a game that I... <laughs> I've I played a little bit of, and I quite liked it, even though I know it's kind of a sort of 7 out of 10, like a sort of poor man's GTA. Um, but I didn't expect to still be playing it, if I'm honest. And I think it's only because I finished Life is Strange and God of War that I have been. But I've been getting a surprising amount of enjoyment out of it, and I'm not really sure quite why. Um, and I was talking to Funk about this, and he kind of echoes the sentiment. So um, rather than have a fuckwit corner... Um, well, we, we do have one with a couple of other bits, but I thought I'd pop this in here. Uh, this is Funk's take on Mafia 3, having uh, gone back to it after I sort of said, you know, uh, grin and bear this intro because it, it does open up. Um, Funk says, yeah, I've been enjoying Mafia 3 after getting through the boring stuff at the beginning. There's a hell of a lot wrong with it. Buggy as hell with things like starting missions, ending missions, talking to people, and the combat when you get indoors is clown shoes. For some reason, though, it's still fun, weirdly satisfying, and I can't quite put my finger on why. Uh, you can poke all the story stuff up your ass, though. Uh, just let me run around GTA style, please. Um, he's absolutely right. Like, it is buggy. Like, the, 
it's not like mega mega buggy when you're sort of doing things but the story stuff absolutely i mean i had uh i completed a, a story mission uh, and it opened up and gave me uh, two other story missions and a side quest which i thought okay i'll do the side quest it was something like go and go and get a boat and smuggle some drugs into the city or something and as i was driving to the side quest the game completely froze uh, locked up completely um and then went to the classic bright blue ps4 error screen saying there's been some errors you want to report it or whatever as if that does anything um and when I fired the game back up, the two main missions were there, uh, and the side mission was nowhere to be found. It was just gone. Um, and I've played on for another, I don't know, three hours since then. Uh, it hasn't come back. <laughs> so I don't know exactly what would happen if that was a story mission, uh, if that's even possible. But fuck me. like It's been out for ages, this game. And I know they haven't got a Rockstar-sized team, um, they didn't have a rockstar sized team working on this and so on but it's still a, a big game like a big budget game you know it was it, it, it was a 2k published title and you would kind of expect a little bit more um and like he says i think the the characters are, are pretty cool a lot of them and the the world that they create the mood that they create with the music helping massively there by the way um, certainly as far as I'm concerned, like it'd be half the game without the soundtrack, um, which is probably a derogatory thing to say about the actual game more than anything. If the game doesn't stand up without Hendrix blaring out, then you've possibly got a problem. But um, yeah, it is fun. Uh, it is quite fun. Um, the sort of feeling of progression as you keep sort of pissing on the chips of various head honchos in different districts is kind of basically what Wild Pants uh, was going for with its with its districts and so on but this game does it far better uh, the story is quite cool the acting's pretty good like really quite strong um so the production values are high but there's just this sort of bugginess to it in a kind of just cause kind of way um which you can either live with or you can't i suppose it depends how much fun you're having and uh, for me and and it looks like funk as well uh, it's fun enough to engage us at the moment. What I would say, though, obviously, is we've had this massive drought, and if there was anything fucking worth picking up right now, uh, in terms of like a single-player story or a, a, a Far Cry-esque open-world game, then I, I don't think either of us would probably be persevering with it. So yeah, um, it was free. So you know, it's a fun game for free. I've already had um, more than enough fun out of it to feel satisfied with it being a PS Plus title. So um, yeah, there you go. A uh, couple more things from me, buddies. Uh, my Formula One career, I just finished, and I somehow snuck the title um, in my McLaren uh, through a lot of uh, careful thought and consideration about what I was doing. Um, the The first season in that game, uh, if you drive anything like I do, i.e. a retard, then you're going to burn your way through like engine components and be constantly having to like order new ones, which results in grid penalties. Um, so I was pretty smart in when I decided to do that. Uh, for example, um, you would think that perhaps if if the race that you were, were doing was one of your uh, weaker ones, then perhaps just sort of take the hit on that particular Grand Prix weekend, uh, get all your grid penalties out the way, somewhere like, you know, Singapore, where it's it's a difficult track and I'm not very good at it anyway, um, and make sure you've got a nice fresh engine for the races that you're good at. But I kind of found the opposite was a better bet in that uh, on the races that I was good at, I was capable of, of getting up and scoring pretty good points from the back of the grid, whereas the having the car in tip-top condition around the tracks that I was shite at uh, was absolutely crucial to me taking the title. And I ended up winning Singapore, the night race, uh, and Suzuka just by trading in all my engine parts beforehand, um, taking a hit and getting sort of a seventh place on that race. Um, and that was absolutely integral in the end. I went into the last two races, Brazil and the Abu Dhabi Ding Dong, um, I was just ahead of, of Raikkonen 
in second in uh, first place and then uh i had some sort of like horror show situation where i completely ballsed it in qualifying for brazil and then it was torrential rain for the entire race um recovered to finish fourth but he won it so going into the ding dong i was three points behind so basically i had uh, provided i finished in front of raikkonen uh, in the points i was going to win that thing um, and at that point I had a, a perfectly good car, perfect conditions, and it's a race we do almost every fucking week. Like, it was never in doubt. I, won, I think I won the final race by sort of 15, 16 seconds in the McLaren. So um, I don't know if I'm going to keep going on this career mode. I've really enjoyed it, but it's a real time sink. You know, if you go through the... You, you really need to do all the practice challenges as well to get your research points to improve your car. I was given the option to move teams, but having gone through a whole season uh, applying loads of research and development points to the car and improving it up to, I think I've got it as the fifth best car now rather than the sort of second last best car, um, it felt a shame to move. Uh, so I've stuck with McLaren and started a new, uh, the second season. You keep all of your upgrades and you can build on them with the view that over several seasons you can eventually make your shitty car the best car. Um, but as it, it, you're talking an hour or so per Grand Prix, so it's a real time sink. Um, so you're talking maybe 20 hours for a season. Um, so whether I go all the way through another one or not, I'm not sure. I mean, we will pick up the new game, which is uh, has just come out, and we will pick that up at some point and once it goes down into a sale. But uh, yeah, for the time being, it's it's kept me um, pretty happy. But I think it's, it maybe it's time to head over to Project Cars Two now, having sunk like a whole season into uh, Formula One. It might be time to do a bit of that in career as well. So that's that. Uh, and finally, from me, uh, we've been playing a little bit of this Knowledge is Power this week. Uh, you'll find it as another free PS Plus game. Uh, it's one of these PlayLink games where you use your mobile phone rather than the controllers, uh, which means that, you know, I think six or seven people can join in. Um, and I, I, I find this game incredibly annoying because it's really close to being a very good game, but some decisions that they've made really spoil the whole experience. Um, the first problem with it is that the questions are far too easy far too easy and there's no uh difficulty settings whatsoever so those are your questions um and that's kind of weird uh, I, I don't really understand that um i would think that you'd have a difficulty level or a jackbox situation where you've got a good selection of different questions but we found we played sort of three rounds of this uh, and i think we maybe got two questions wrong out of I don't know 60 odd questions it's just too too easy and if it's that simple and you're both getting it right all the time then what's the, it just feels pointless to me um the other problem I have with it is the whole game is centered around these sort of power-ups where you sabotage your opponents so you all maybe have ice uh, or slime or bombs and they do different things so the slime covers up all the answers so you have to swipe them off your phone before you pick the right answer uh, the ice turns all of the answers into an icicle so you have to sort of tap away at them takes you longer to answer um, and so that's annoying as well to me because it doesn't necessarily reward you for um, being in any way smart or quick uh, You just it's, it just comes down to you know how fucked over you've got um, and then the other big problems kind of centered around the flow of the game and the graphics. Firstly, it looks beautiful and uh, is a really nice art style and very well put together, but it runs like fucking shit. So it, the, the whole game at, at all times runs at about, I don't know, 20, 23 frames per second or something, which you get used to after a while, but it's just, there's no reason for it. There's fuck all going on. Like, coming off of Formula 1 and God of War into Knowledge's Power, which, you know, there's barely anything even moving on the screen, and yet all of the movement, the V-Sync issues, is horrendous. And it's such a shame, because the artwork's brilliant. They've obviously got a real good dude doing the art design, and a real fuckwit doing the engine design, because it just runs like shit. And I just find that very strange as well, with these PlayLink games, where Sony trying to push this kind of family kind of thing i think that that they've been trying to sort of combat that switch audience a little bit by trying to make it as though you've got these family party games 
and then it doesn't even show off the console in a in a good light at all. Um, so that's a bit weird. It, it smacks of a small team um, to me, um, or an inexperienced one. But it's just such a shame. Like if if the game looked like shit as well as running like shit, then you wouldn't care so much. But the fact that it's so meticulously designed and quite beautiful, you've got this sort of wonderful pyramid as the sort of final round where you work your way up the steps. And it all looks so lovely, but it just runs so bad. It, it almost makes my eyes hurt. Miserable. Um, and then the final big problem with it is that the, the the whole thing, kind of the whole process of playing the game is very slow. Uh, you pick a, a new category between every question, which just takes up loads of time, kind of ruins the flow. There was no need for that. You could have three or five questions per category and have those category choices uh, half as much or a third as much, and it would be a much better game. Um, so yeah, it's another case of so so near yet so far, and all it led us to do, of course, was play it briefly, then turn it off and load up Jackbox. So I would recommend picking up Jackbox if you're looking for a party game. Obviously, this is free, so you could give it a try. Um, but there we go. So yeah, there you go, buddy. It's not bad, is it? Considering I've been away, um, played a fair bit. So there you go. Um, and now we shall move on. Now it's time for the news. The news, the news, the, you know, the news. And so on. Uh, Number one, number wang, number one, number wang. Uh, Spyro Reignited Trilogy delayed until November. Uh, The developer is Toys for Bob on this trilogy port remaster whatever you want to call it. Uh, Says that the game needs more, and I quote, love and care uh, I only mention this because a a lot of people for some reason care about this game Spyro. Um, it's got a big following, so maybe you care about it as well. Um, but b more importantly, uh, I'm going to end up playing this game because it's one of my missus's favourite uh, franchises. She's a huge fan, uh, and will no doubt sucker me into picking it up, probably for too much money, uh, just like Crash Bandicoot. She's got previous. So, um, yeah, it's been delayed. It was actually due out, I think, next week, but uh, they've pushed it to the very last minute. Uh, This is Activision published, so um, kind of a big publisher behind it. Um, But, yeah, uh, I think it's going to sell really well. And to be honest, I would have probably brought it out in November anyway. You shove it out in the sort of lead up to Christmas for around sort of £30, £35. Um, And maybe that's a better bet, uh, certainly for Christmas sales and stuff. So, yeah, either way, that's been delayed, which is probably a good thing. It sounds like it needs some more work, so that's fine. Uh, Number two, uh, this is boring, so we'll just run through it very quickly. I just want to report on it and um, follow it up because we reported on it. Uh, Black Ops 4's body armour. Community was complaining that it took too long to kill folk with it, and it ruined the spirit of the game. Uh, On last week's show, uh, I heard Ash had tried the... uh, the open or closed beta rather Um, and he said he thought it was a good idea to have the armour I don't really necessarily agree with that but I also didn't play the game so he probably knows better than I do Um, it looks like Treyarch have made multiple changes though because the community really was shouting very loud indeed Uh, so they've made the armour less durable Uh, they've made it so it only reduces damage rather than completely stopping damage Um, and Uh, giving anyone who kills someone with the armor a large bonus on their score towards their sort of kill streak um, or whatever. Uh, This is the last time I will talk about Call of Duty's fucking body armor. So there we go. Uh, Next, uh, we must dip a toe back into this um, Philip Mucian um, plagiarism thing, uh, (laughs) which has been running and running and running. Um, I think at this point, if you are familiar with gaming news at all, then you've probably had enough of this. So I'm just going to rattle through this very quickly. Um, you're, you may or may not remember that Philip Mushin was a uh, an editor at IGN. Uh, he posted a review of Dead Cells for the Switch um, and Boomstick Gaming, who are uh, uh, another YouTube channel, um, posted a video showing that their review... Uh, which came out two weeks prior to uh, the IGN review, uh, had basically been plagiarised in a big way. Um, whole sort of sections of it kind of moved around, but the structure the same, uh, a lot of the sentences almost identical. Um, 
basically they'd been ripped off at which point IGN um, suspended um, Philip Mushin and uh, took the review down pending an investigation they investigated they then fired him uh, then they removed the review and apologised um, and that was that for a little while I think that was where we were up to the first time we were talking about this um, uh, there was radio silence for a few days from Mushin, and then he uh, released a video, which I think a lot of people presumed would be an apology and was anything but. Um, he claimed that it was purely coincidental that the two videos were similar. Um, he uh, moaned a hell of a lot about uh, Kotaku um, because they originally reported on it, um, claiming that they were kicking a man while he was down. He apologised to IGN for dragging their name through the mud, but never apologised to Boomstick Gaming, who he'd ripped off. And then bafflingly, uh, and this is fun, um, called out Kotaku, uh, specifically, namely Jason Schreier, their uh, sort of Billy Big Balls uh, journalist editor bloke, saying, I dare you to find any other examples of uh, me plagiarising anything. Um, this is a guy who was hired a couple of years ago by IGN and before that had a relatively successful YouTube channel where he was doing basically what he's doing, for, what he was doing for IGN. Um, and yeah, it was so smug and weird uh, and annoying and I think anyone who watched it would have been fucking livid to the point where... Uh, not necessarily Schreier himself, but certainly anyone who saw the video was was, was sort of like challenge accepted. And they started, uh, it was fairly easy, you just take a transcript of one of Mushin's YouTube videos or articles and Google it and see if you get any other hits. So people started doing this and lo and behold, more and more and more content was found. Uh, he dripped off everyone from Nintendo Magazine to the Sydney Herald, um, he'd even written a thoughts on how the Joy-Cons work on a Switch review, uh, impressions video rather, uh, where he'd literally read a post off of a forum. It was on NeoGAF. Uh, someone had just sort of written a little blurb about how they thought it worked. Just read it verbatim, including the bit that said, in my opinion. Um, so yeah, uh, he's also ripped off uh, Octopath Traveler review from a, an IGN colleague. Uh, they wrote the Wii U review. He re reviewed it for the Switch release and uh, plagiarized their article, which they didn't know about, and they were very, very angry indeed. Um, to the point where eventually it emerged that his even his CV on LinkedIn is just copied uh, off of a CV database uh, templates website. Um, so yeah, I mean, there's more and more coming out. Uh, I think it's it's quite funny, but I also find it very angry. Um, people like Ash and I, we, you know, we've always been hugely keen on video games. We've always kind of angled for uh, maybe getting into the industry or starting our own thing up. And the idea that someone who's um, fairly prominent and in that sort of dream job that I'm sure a lot of people listening would love to do um, would abuse that power so wildly whilst like shitting on all of his peers um i don't know suffice it to say uh his ap apology within with bunny ears review was um video was removed and no one's heard from him since uh and uh, presumably nor will they um absolutely mental uh, a lot of people have kind of been moaning about this uh, from a sort of uh, IGN should have known they should have done something kind of standpoint um, I, I'm not sure that's the case I think IGN have, have conducted themselves very well they've come out looking pretty good considering um, because I, I genuinely you know the, the, there's nothing in it for them to have a dude who's doing this so it, they clearly had no idea um, and I don't know how you'd guard against it really uh, either I don't know how he got away with it for so long but uh, quite how you'd guard against it I mean I know when you're doing a course at, at a college or a university, there's software that uh, is used when you submit. Uh, there was something I, when I was at, at uni in Bath that was um, called Turnitin, which just cross-references cross whole paragraphs from your essays or dissertations or whatever, just to make sure that they don't get any hits anywhere else. But when it comes to YouTubers and YouTube videos and stuff, um, that would be pretty difficult to do. And also wildly unnecessary, surely. Um, very very strange and and the guy flat out said that he the first thing he does when he reviews something is 
reads and watches everyone else's stuff. So he just inherently didn't understand what his job was, uh, it would seem. Um, but quite rightly found out, fuck that guy. Um, and yeah, there you go. That's that. A few more bits. EA Sports has announced that this year's FIFA will have all the Spanish La Liga stadiums, uh, except the Camp Nou, which uh, Pez has exclusively. So that's nice. Um, little discussion about FIFA a little bit later on, so we'll move on for now. Uh, Dying Light Bad Blood uh, is a Battle Royale spin-off from Dying Light. I don't think we've ever actually mentioned it, because um, there's so many Battle Royale games coming out that we forgot it actually existed. Uh, but it's getting an early access beta on PC in September. There'll be no beta for the consoles, but it is coming out on both, allegedly. Um, if you go to dyinglightgame.com forward slash bad blood, uh, you can register for the PC beta um, uh, sometime in September. That was a cool game with a cool engine. Uh, the idea of having all of these sort of uh, quite quick parkour mechanics in a battle royale game that, that could work pretty well having said that I have no interest really in any but battle royale games so I'm probably not the person to talk to but um, yeah there's that um, fantastic fucking video game Velocity 2X uh, is releasing shortly on Switch and uh, this was a game that was PS Plus it might be the first PS Plus on PS4 or certainly very close to uh, also uh, cross play on Vita fucking brilliant game uh, I loved it uh, played the balls off it um, and this week developer Future Lab has been talking about how being a PS Plus game um, has its positives but also its negatives uh, essentially they've been trying to uh, get a sequel for this game published for a really long time um, they've got a working um, build of it and people have played it and they really like it uh, but they need that publisher to, to go global with it Um and they haven't been able to do that because every time they've uh, had a meeting, um, they've been showing it off and everything's been hunky-dory until it comes to the sales figures. Uh, and the game sold absolutely miserably because it was very early in the PS4's life cycle. Everyone picked it up, PS Plus. Um, they also didn't help themselves by launching the PC version the same week that Windows 10 came out, um, only to find that the game there was a game-breaking bug. Uh, when running that thing on Windows 10, and that took them a really long time to fix. Basically completely destroyed any possibility of them having any sort of PC success with that game, uh, and certainly any sale figures to fall back on. Um, obviously they made money via the PS Plus contracts, I don't know exactly how it works, but they'll have taken a big cut there from Sony. Um, but the long and the short of all of this is they have a publisher for the Switch version who, uh, that, that publisher being Curve Digital and uh, they're hoping that uh, it will sell well on Switch and entice Curve into publishing um, a, a sequel to the game so uh, yeah I hope so too as I said absolutely brilliant game if you if you didn't play it at the time maybe you added it to your library um, didn't get around to it uh, it's an absolutely brilliant uh, sort of top down uh, old school sort of shoot 'em up with some really clever teleportation mechanics. It's a fucking blast. Like it's really fun. So um, yeah, get on that if you haven't. And hopefully it will sell well on the Switch. It's the sort of game that should. It certainly sold well on the Vita, uh, for what it's worth. Um, yeah. So yeah, there you go. Uh, next, the new Nvidia cards have been unveiled. Uh, they were unveiled at Gamescom. Uh, the yeah, long anticipated uh, RTX 2070, RTX 2080, and RTX 2080 Ti. Um, <clears throat> these will be the replacements for, well, for example, the 1080 Ti. Uh, these Titan cards that have been um, kind of the Billy Big Balls card for a very, very long time now. Um, an alarming amount of time for uh, the life cycle of a graphics card, to be honest. Probably a lot of it to do with the uh, with the mining thing, with the uh, bit currency. Um, so let's talk, buddies, about ray tracing. Uh, this is something that you are probably going to hear a lot about uh, in the coming years. Uh, I will now attempt to explain ray tracing, uh, a subject I don't know a great deal about and was only introduced to very recently, uh, which makes this a textbook JFG podcast moment, I think you'll find. Um... So ray tracing is a, a, a way of 
rendering light in video games. Uh, the way that uh, most lighting engines work at the moment is objects are drawn from back to front so that if uh, something in front is obscuring something behind, then that's all drawn in and that's how it computes things. Ray tracing is um, a, an engine which literally simulates light in real time. So you can um, point a light in the in an in-game engine at a series of uh, pre-programmed objects and it will automatically and in absolute live real time uh, reflect off of anything it should reflect off of. Beams of light will go exactly where they should go. They'll hit objects exactly the way that they should hit objects. Um, this means that stuff like mirrors works very well. Uh, the outlines, round bodies, everything just... It's, it's one of the biggest game changers that you will ever come across from graphics one of the one of the things that stops graphics from looking photorealistic is the natural light of the world versus a sort of rendering and the sort of computing power required to render natural light it, it tends to be astronomical um this is going to be a, a huge thing. Um, I've seen some footage. They released a bit of Star Wars footage from Gamescom showing this thing off. Um, and previously, they've had to use, um, you know, whole sort of server rigs to get this going. I think they were using four separate computers to render this trailer. Um, uh, the word on the street is that the 2080 Ti um, will be as as adept as those four computers they used for that trailer. Um, and that's going to be out the gate. You're going to be able to pick that up and buy it. So, yeah, ray tracing is all about lighting. Um, it's really weird to think of, but it's essentially a, a lighting engine that works like real life does, like real light does, rather. Um, and up until this point, it's been far too heavy on uh, computing power for you to actually get that in a sort of end user environment uh, of course they use it in in movies you know i'm sure sort of pixar and so on have been using stuff like this for a long time um so yeah that's the big thing obviously they're going to be super powerful as well like mega mega power um <clears throat> so you'll be looking at 4k joys and so on maybe higher sort of 8k in the future um so yeah that's kind of what we know at this point um Digital Foundry have done a good article on Eurogamer, so if you want to uh, have an expert explain all of this to you uh, rather than a twat, then uh, I would head over there if I were you. Um, but the other interesting thing that came out was the uh, the cards prices, which haven't been officially announced, but kind of skirted around, popped up on various websites and so on. Um, and this is the reason that I'll probably likely never build a gaming PC again. Um so the 2017, um, not 2017, sorry, 2070 uh, will be around $500, £450. The 2080, uh, $700, uh, £670. Pounds. Uh, and the 2080 Ti will be $1,000 or £920 pounds for the graphics card before you buy anything else. Um the 2080 models will release on the 20th of September. You can already pre-order them. Go get your wallets out, buddies. Get stuck in. Uh, the 2070 will be coming out in October time. So uh, there you go. Um, <clears throat> obviously, this makes you wonder what's going to be happening in the next generation of consoles. Uh, we'll certainly get onto that later on as well, buddies. So a few more bits. Loads of news, which is probably best because I haven't got anyone to talk to. So uh, at least I've got something to say. Battlefield 5 Open Beta will be the 6th of September on all platforms. Uh, if you're part of the EA Brigade, then I think you get it on the 4th. You can preload it on all platforms from the 3rd of September. And we'll probably give that a whirl. Uh, we played a fair bit of Battlefield 1 before getting completely sick of it uh, and then not playing it anymore resulting in us having a shit time everywhere we, every time we went back because everyone was so much better than us, which tends to be the way with these shooters these days for us. But we'll give that a go. Next, Twitch is getting a kicking for removing the perk of ad-free viewing from Twitch Prime. Um, used to be one of the things as well as getting free games and so on on Twitch Prime. Um, you had no ads to worry about on the channels that you were watching. 
Uh, you'll now need a more expensive service like Twitch Turbo, buddies, uh, to get ad-free. Um, or sub to the channels on a monthly basis as before, as though you're some peon without Twitch Prime. Um, Twitch is claiming that this is to help streamers achieve more revenue, uh, which which has a, a distinct whiff of bullshit about it. Um, the community is less than impressed, um, and most people just assume, probably quite rightly, that it's just corporate greed on the part of Amazon. They want to have their cake and eat it. Um, and I think most people who subscribe to that service do so to uh, specifically avoid the ads. They're not doing it for the shitty games. Um, they just do it to avoid the ads. So I think they're going to end up losing a lot of subs there because, yeah, people aren't just going to subscribe to get seven-year-old video games. They they wanted more. Um, so there. A few more bits. Super massive um, of Until Dawn fame. Uh, they've announced the project that they've been working on since Until Dawn. Um, it's called The Dark Pictures Anthology, and it's going to be uh, an episodic game set, uh, a set of horror stories. So it's going to be starting with a group of divers investigating a sunken plane crash. There's a video of that uh, on YouTube that you can see. No gameplay, like fuck all gameplay at this point, just a sort of story trailer. But... Um, it's got a very Until Dawn vibe about it with the sort of character models and uh, Until Dawn kind of switched in and out of engine quite nicely as well. Um, Until Dawn, by the way, was a fucking brilliant game. I know I've said it before. Uh, it's an excellent game uh, and, a, and the sort of game that you can play with people who don't give a fuck about video games. Um, if you've got a, a movie fan who doesn't necessarily play games, then this is a good one. Uh, I played through this with the missus. I know a few people who've kind of played through it with uh, families as well, although older families, not for kids, this game. Um, so yeah, I'm kind of interested in this, if I'm honest. I really enjoyed Until Dawn. We played it in one sitting, a uh, sort of 12-hour sitting, uh, because we were just hooked on it. And the characters started off uh, being really annoying in a sort of teen movie type way and then you kind of found out that they were doing that on purpose and they kind of fleshed them out and it was very interesting um well written well acted big names in there as well um so yeah this is going to be interesting and um yeah if it's anything like until dawn then we'll be we'll be well up for this one uh next amazon has been making a uh the grand tour game fully licensed from the show uh, it's going to be an episodic racing game it might be free and it might launch alongside each episode of the next series uh, which is thought to be coming in December uh, not really sure about that yet and not many details but they've kind of given the impression that it's going to be episodic and there'll perhaps be uh, challenges or episodes that relate to the uh, actual TV show um, the game looks a little bit a little bit shit in a sort of uh, arcadey iOS kind of way, but being so arcadey, it may well be fun. Uh, and it also includes four-player split screen, which is a rarity these days. Um, so yeah, worth keeping an eye on. Obviously, if it's free, then we'll give it a go anyway. Um, but yeah, so that's on the way. That's what they've been doing. Uh, and finally, in the news this week, buddies, Assassin's Creed is taking a year off. Um, probably just stop making the fucking thing. Uh, I would suggest. But uh, yeah, so they're taking another year off. I think there've been there's been two two years in a row since the last time they took a year off. Maybe three. It's hard to keep track. They're all called Odyssey Syndicate. Fucking, I don't even know. But um, yeah, so there won't be one of those next year. There'll be presumably one the following year. Um, probably just give it a miss. So there you go, buddies. A fair old whack of news there for you. Uh, and now we will move on. And now it's time for Out This Week. Let's take a look at some games coming out this week. Probably filled with microtransactions that crazy pay to win mechanics. Because fuck you all. Fuck you all. So we've got a few bits and bobs this week, buddies, and uh, some interesting stuff, actually. Uh, early signs we may well be heading out of the lengthy summer drought as we creep into September. Um, starting with Little Dragon's Cafe, 
coming to PS4 and Switch. Uh, this is a story of uh, two siblings raising a dragon and managing the family business while trying to discover what is causing their mother's illness and finding a cure. We also have Monster Hunter Generations Ultimate on the Switch, uh, which is Monster Hunter's mate. Uh, we got Pez 2019 out this week. It's Pez. We got that pre-ordered because we're cheeky boiks um, and we love a bit of it. So uh, I'm looking forward to picking that up. Uh, we've got Strange Brigade, which I was kind of touting as my possible Dead Island syndrome. That's not going to happen now by the looks of things. Uh, but it is a first-person co-op shooter uh, from the Sniper Elite guys um, with a bit of a sort of tongue-in-cheek 40s vibe to it. Kind of a bit of an Indiana Jones thing going on as well. Um, but from the gameplay that I've seen of this, it, it really just kind of looks like a horde mode game. You know, enter an area, uh, enemies will keep coming at you, solve a very menial um, sort of physics-based puzzle of some kind, and then move into the next area and fight another load of zombies or, or whatever. Um, which isn't quite as exciting as I was hoping, but um, we'll keep an eye on the reviews and so on for that one. I think it's launching at a lower price as well. It's going to be sort of 35, 40 quid rather than your sort of 50 or 60. So uh, maybe they're kind of marketing that mid-range anyway. Uh, we've also got Blade Strangers on PS4, Switch and PC. It is a uh, strange Japanese fighting game uh, that I won't pretend to know anything about. Uh, we have Donut County coming to PS4, PC and iOS where you play literally a hole uh, in the floor that can move around. And there's a series of, sort of physics-based puzzles where maybe you have to move your hole over to drain some water away or get rid of an object that's in the way of something else. It's quite clever. It's also quite hard to explain because it sounds stupid, um, but worth popping onto YouTube and having a quick look because in terms of uh, puzzle games... It looks quite fun, and it's got a lovely cartoony art style to it as well. Quite colourful and quite tongue-in-cheek, so um, possibly worth a look. We also have Freedom Planet on the Switch, which is a 2D side-scroller. Um, it's a very old uh, game, actually. I think it came out in 2014 on other platforms, but obviously that doesn't really matter when you're making a sort of 16-bit 2D platformer. Uh, very, very Sonic-y. Uh, a lot of people kind of said it's the best um, Sonic game since sort of Sonic 3 um, despite not being one so take that as you will but uh, yeah if you like your retro platformers then uh, it's got all the sort of loop-de-loops and, and jumping on the heads of enemies and so on that you're after and finally out this week we've got Divinity Original Sin 2 coming to consoles coming to PS4 and Xbox One um, this has been a massive hit on PC and uh, reviewed spectacularly and uh, I'm sure that there's a few people who listen to the pod who have sunk a lot of time into Divinity Original Sin 2 on the PC um, this has got four player online co-op it's a sort of Diablo-esque looking game but it's a, it's an RPG with turn based combat rather than a hack and slasher um, and the combat's kind of a, a mixture of your sort of yeah your turn based select and attack Pokemon type thing and your sort of XCOM kind of style of combat where you're sort of hiding behind objects and so on but it's got all of that rpg shit that you love with your character creation um a great deal of different elements involved crafting um base stuff um and it's a massive game as well um and with that four player co-op in mind um that kind of gives it that a, a unique aspect i think so um, I don't know, we're going to be taking a look at this. I'm not sure what it's launching out there. They're marketing this as a definitive edition, but um, I suppose we'll see as to what that exactly means. There's um, a fairly lengthy explanation trailer on the PlayStation official YouTube channel that kind of tells you a few different bits and pieces about it. But if you do play this, buddies, or if you have played this, then we'd like to hear from you because uh, I think we'll probably consider picking this up. Uh, it may be the sort of last big time sink we get into um, before old Funk goes off on his world travels. So um, yeah, uh, please get in touch jump jump onto the jfgpodcast.co.uk forward slash street beat buddies uh, if you've got anything to say about Divinity because uh, I'm interested. So yeah and that is out this week and now it's time for Fuckwit Corner <laughs> Back with Kurt with Funk. 
and get them questions. Fuck man. Fuck. Oh. We've got two little bits here from Funk. Obviously, I took his uh, his Mafia uh, musings and uh, plonked them in the what we've been playing section. But he still came back with this. Firstly, he says, FIFA versus Pez. We had an interesting chat the other night about how FIFA has all the modes and bells and whistles, but Pez has the gameplay. It's still Pez for me, I think, but discuss. Yeah, I, I kind of instigated this chat with Funk the other night because I... I keep seeing more and more of FIFA uh, and all of the modes and options that it has. Uh, and it makes me kind of pine for it a little bit. Uh, it, this is more of a grass is greener, I think, situation. Um, because the mode pro clubs that we used to play, as I understand it, having done a little bit of digging today, hasn't changed a fucking iota since we stopped playing it sort of five years ago um, and isn't changing at all for this iteration either they've done absolutely nothing to that game mode um, they've been pretty good with their marketing FIFA I, I think it's it's the fact that the Premier League's just come back we've been watching the football again on sort of the sort of sky broadcast with Martin Tyler and um, all of the sort of beautiful sort of purple and green graphics and everything and FIFA does just does a fantastic job with its presentation um, and that style and all of the little facts and stuff like the commentary alone. Uh, the commentary is so woeful in Pez that you, I've just turned it off. Uh, I don't know how anyone could could listen to it. Um, so you don't get any of that commentary. And if you're a football fan, then I think you know that that commentary is quite important. It really adds to the feel of it. Um, so yeah, we're we're still in the same position as before. It's a shame that FIFA couldn't get their demo out a little bit earlier because I would like to have played it before we picked up Pez. But the engine hasn't changed. The gameplay hasn't changed. Um, a few different modes have been put in, but a lot of them don't necessarily correlate to things that we touch anyway. I know they've got all of these new party modes in kickoff uh, for local play where you can play um, maybe that survival mode where you lose a player if you score a goal, various rules like no offsides or turning off the referees and so on. Um, but yeah, it just it's all very enticing because being such a football fan, um, it's such a, an accurate representation of everything around football uh, that it just makes me want it. I know the career mode's better than Pez's tired Master League. Um, and Pez hasn't really helped itself by basically not adding anything new in terms of game modes um, for for quite some time. I mean, obviously they had their big co-op mode that they added that lets you play th up to three players versus up to three players, which you could do before in their um, in their game rooms. But there's no proper matchmaking system on that game other than three v three, and it's just a shame that. Uh, there's such a big, vast difference between the quality of one game and the other in terms of all of the menus and the licenses and everything. Um, but the, all of that does pale in comparison to the fact that Pez, it's up until... Obviously, I can't speak for FIFA this year, but I can certainly suspect, based on a lot of gameplay footage that I've seen and the fact that I know that they're using the same engine and the same mechanics, I played... I played this year's FIFA demo uh, quite extensively when it came out. And uh, f for me, it just isn't as good. It just isn't as good, gameplay-wise. And FIFA's probably a better package overall. Um, it's hard to argue that, because they've got so much going for them. Um, but the game is worse. Pez is a better football game in terms of the minute-to-minute -minute action on the pitch. And it looks very much to me like that remains the case this year. So for that reason, we're picking up Pez. And uh, there we go. We've made our bed. Uh, finally, from Funk, he says this. Uh, I still haven't played Gang Beasts with anyone. That needs to change. Yes, uh, Funk and uh, myself and Ash, we picked up Gang Beasts when it was in the sale. I think Ash and I have played it once together. Um, I don't know how many of our other friends have got it as well. I think you can play up to four player on that. 
But I think we'll pencil that in for game night this week, Funk. Um, get on Gang Beasts and give it a little go. It's it's fun. It's just a fun, sort of frivolous, nothing game that you can sort of laugh at for half an hour and then turn off. So, um, yeah, I think we picked it up for three quid or something. So, there we go. So, yeah, thanks very much, Funk. Every week, we end the show with questions and comments sent in by you. If you've got anything for us, just pop an email to the jfgpodcast.gmail.com or contact us on Facebook, Twitter, or at justforgamers.co.uk. And now it's time for JFG Street Beat. You got a question we want to know. Facebook, Twitter, we're on a mall. So hit us up and be on the show. The JFG Street Beat. Mm, We want to know. Get on the show. Get on the show. And <laughs> bafflingly, despite not being on the show, Ash is on the show uh, because he's been kind enough to pop me a question for JFG Street Beat. So JFG Ash says, So the PS5 is out next year, maybe. Is it going to be 4K60 like the new 2080 Ti or a slightly better version of the PS4 Pro? Um Ash's question, as well as obviously the the launch of the NVIDIA cards, which is making people think um, maybe this console's not too far away, um, it also follows a report uh, in Japan from a well-respected analyst, Hideki Yasuda, sorry if I've murdered that, who says that his sources are expecting to begin producing the console within the next 12 months for a Christmas 2019 release. Um Apparently, the main thing that could stop this happening is a shortage of um, MLCC, or monolithic ceramic capacitors. Um, I do my research, buddies. Which lots of systems and phones are currently using in their hardware. Uh, PS4 uses them, and inevitably PS5 would use them as well. Um, So back to Ashley's question. Uh, It's out next year, maybe. Is it going to be 4K60 like the 2080 Ti? Uh, or a slightly better version of the Pro. Uh, I think it would be a slightly better version of the Pro. I think they use that Ryzen chip. I don't think that the NVIDIA cards will go anywhere near these con- the, the, the next consoles that come out because they're just too expensive. The 1080 Ti is a grand. You cannot even strip down um, and market that in any meaningful way to consumers who are looking to buy game consoles. Um, and for that reason, I think that we could see the biggest uh, giant gulf in difference in power between the next consoles and PCs Uh, obviously PCs are always more powerful, that's been the case uh, probably forever I think when the um, when the original Xbox came out it was possibly around the level of a high end PC very briefly before PCs obviously shot off into the distance during its console cycle Um, I think that the only way that you could include this this sort of technology is to wait longer, in which case it wouldn't be coming out next Christmas. Um, but realistically, I still think that you there's just no way to contend with the price there. Um, and I think, yeah, I think that the next generation of consoles is not going to be mega, mega more powerful than these ones until they can make that leap into that sort of technology bracket i just don't see the jump being significant so uh there's every chance that it come out next christmas um and be a much better version of the ps4 pro i I mean obviously sony their next console has to be more powerful than the xbox one x surely um otherwise it's going to be a joke isn't it i mean there's there's a power struggle here but the inherent problem and we've mentioned it many times on the show before i think is that I don't believe that anyone's really asked about that 60 frames. From a specifically console standpoint, they just want beautiful 4K images shown on 4K TVs as those 4K TVs are reducing in price. I just don't think it's the priority of the platform holders to get that frame rate up. Uh, I think there's every chance they'd be aiming for 6K or 8K 30 rather than 4K 60. Uh, and that's incredibly disappointing. I think we're all on board. Probably everyone who listens to this show uh, is in agreement that you'd rather have that 60 frames and a lower resolution than have a higher resolution than 30 frames. Um, 
so yeah, uh, long and the short of it, I I don't think that the console will come out next Christmas. I I, I said at the time I thought twenty twenty earliest, and I still I still maintain that. Um, but I certainly think if it does come out next Christmas, um, from a sort of progression standpoint, probably not going to be worth buying. Frankly, as this new tech comes out for PC, uh, I just think it's going to be too far away from that and too expensive to integrate. So. Yeah, uh, it's looking to me, and I know that Ash doesn't like this at all, and I understand that this is looking like another lengthy life cycle for me. Um, just because of the way that all the technologies are kind of marrying up at the wrong times. Uh, it's kind of interesting. But uh, yeah, if they're releasing a console that's that's targeting 4K30, I'm not fucking interested. I don't have a 4K TV at the moment, and I don't want to play 30 frames games anyway. So if I have to play them, then I'll just play them on what I've got. So yeah, that is how I feel about it, buddies. But thanks very much, Ash, for giving me something to fucking talk about in the middle of this Wednesday. So I think that'll about do us for episode 177. Um, it feels as the f- the fact that we had so much news, um, and I'm just sitting here talking through it on my own. I feel like the podcast became more and more dry as it went along, probably less and less fun uh, without the sort of um, frivolity and lewdness and joy that a certain little JFG Ash brings to proceedings. So hopefully you haven't been too bored by this. Um, But thanks very much for listening anyway. Um, Ash has been kind enough to offer to edit this, despite the fact that he's not on it. Um, So uh, this will be up as normal. And uh, I've just remembered I don't need to go through all of the different web links because I recorded that new jingle. So thanks very much to me from several weeks ago. Um, I'm not sure what the state of play will be next week, buddies. Um, Rest assured something will go up uh, if it's me on my own or if Ash is back, or if I find someone to rope in to uh, to do it with. But either way, uh, the podcast, episode 178, will return on time, on schedule next week. Uh, but until then, uh, thanks so much for listening, if you did, and if you still are. Um, and I've been Alex, and I'll catch you next time. You've been listening to the JFG Podcast with Ash and me, Alex. You can find us at www.thejfgpodcast.co.uk where you'll also find our Discord and Streetbeat if you want to get involved with the show. Our Facebook is forward slash the JFG Podcast and our Twitter handle is at the JFG Podcast. We're on all those video streaming sites too, buddies, from ChewTube to Twitch.tv forward slash the JFG Podcast to Mixer.com, aka Beam.FuckingPro. We've got a PS4 community you can join. Just search the JFG podcast on there. And we're also on Google Plus if that is how you choose to live your life. Thanks so much for listening, buddies. We'll catch you next time. Mm